Thank you everyone for gathering back uh, after the break. Hopefully everyone had uh, great conversations. Uh, for this next session, I would like to introduce our session moderator, Mira Raja, who is VP of Deep Tech at P33, an inclusive tech ecosystem growing nonprofit here in the region. Thanks, Mira. Thanks, Kate. Um, really excited for this session um, where we'll have a conversation between Nadia Mason and Arvind Krishna. Um, uh, Nadia Mason is the Dean of the Pritzker School of Molecular Engin Engineering at the University of Chicago. Um, she specializes in experimental studies of quantum materials with a research focus on the electronic properties of nanoscale and correlated systems, such as atomically thin membranes and nanostructured superconductors. I wanted to read that off of here to make sure I didn't get it wrong. <laughs> um, her research is relevant to applications involving nanoscale and quantum computing elements. Um, Dr. Mason is committed to increasing inclusivity and improving science communication. She is also the former chair of the APS Committee on Minorities, where she helped initiate the National Mentoring Community, and can also be seen in a TED Talk on scientific curiosity. She received her BS from Harvard University and a PhD from Stanford University, both in physics. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and has been recognized with awards, including the 2012 APS Maria Goppert Mayor Award and the 29. 2019 APS Boucher Award. Um, Nadia will be leading a conversation with Dr. Arvind Krishna, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of IBM. Um, Dr. Krishna, as a business leader and technologist, has led the development of new markets for IBM in artificial intelligence, cloud, quantum computing, and blockchain. He has also played a significant role in developing innovative IBM products and solutions based on these technologies. Over his 30-year IBM career, Arvin led many bold transformations and delivered proven results. He drove the successful $34 billion acquisition of Red Hat that has, been defined, that has defined the hybrid cloud market. He is previously the SVP of cloud and cognitive software and headed IBM Research, where he drove innovation in core and emerging technologies. Dr. Krishna is a member of the Board of Directors of the NY New York's Federal Reserve Bank, and he serves on the Board of Directors of North, Northrop Grumman. He has an undergrad degree from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur and a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I will turn it over to both of you for the conversation. Thank you. Uh, so let me start by saying again, thank you for being here with us today. It's really wonderful to have you, given IBM's huge commitments in this area. So the first question is about um, IBM, IBM's role as a pioneer in the development of computers, from punch cards, the first electronic computer, PCs to supercomputers. Do you see parallels between what's happening in quantum computing today and how advances were made in these other game-changing technologies? You know, for example, how, you know, how is IBM's experience in leading previous technological revolutions informing your approach to quantum computing today? Yes, yeah, so Professor Mason, first, it's a pleasure to be here, and it really is an honor to be able to speak to this audience and actually a larger audience that's online also. Look, I think there's a lot that informs us. I'll say always, one shouldn't take it too literally, but there is a lot you can learn from these previous ones. And I'll take maybe two of the examples amongst the many that you took. Uh, some of the inhibitions as well as advantages are from the technology side, but there's an equal number on the business side. Uh, take semiconductors. And actually, I'll take an example that is not that well understood, which is the change in the 1990s, not the 1950s and 60s. In the 1990s, the world was moving from what were called bipolar technologies to CMOS. Massive advantages. How about you scale, uh, cooling? And if you ask why did the world want to move from bipolar to CMOS, slight issue of heat. Um, the density inside the chips was exceeding that of nuclear reactors. And so when you worry about the heat there, you really were literally afraid you'd be melting the, the chips, including the ceramic substrates. So that's, that's a real issue. And so you get all the issues. So what do you learn from that? Yes, you can go construct a fab. You gotta invest a lot of money, you gotta invest in the technology, you learn how to get what is called sort of the, what is not just called digital, but CMOS technology scaling, great. How about uh, 
all of the issues around how do you resolve system performance. So then you begin to look at, well, if you increase memory, memory can compensate for some decrease in the clock speed. Well, you got to go scale linearly uh, back to where I think Dr. Simmons was talking about modularity. If you couldn't build a modular system, there's no way you would get the complete system performance. How do you get that, but still have all of the aspects of a single system image uh, that is there? So you got to go resolve all these problems and you got to work across material scientists, physicists, chemists, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, you can, mechanical engineers, you can lay out the listening. I think all of those lessons apply here. And when I think about uh, quantum, I'll take one really what sounds like a simple problem. So the technology IBM works on is a little bit different than what others are working on. Many others work on photonics, others work on different forms, some work on quantum dots. The technology we are on right now is superconducting qubits, but that means the temperature is 10, 15 millikelvin. You gotta get from room temperature down to those temperatures. And so you get into the issue of how do you do that? Well, the cryogenics to do it are I think reasonably well understood. What happens to all the waveguides is maybe not so well understood. And you gotta worry about keeping these systems up and running and how do you make them up and running so that you don't have to have a room full of PhDs come in to tune them between uh, runs. It's all the system engineering problems that I think we learned a lot from um, that era and uh, those transformations. So you really have to look at integrated systems, not one problem at a time, but in parallel and how to get them all working together. Absolutely. Uh, room temperature electronics to control these, um, everybody will talk about I.O. But the state of the art on I.O. till about a couple of years ago, it took $100,000, literally $100,000 of control electronics to go control these things. You want to build a 100,000 qubit quantum computer like we heard in the morning, 10 to the five, 10 to the five, you're talking 10 to the 10, so $10 billion of control electronics. You begin to reach the stage of it's not very feasible. So you got to drive the cost down to your yeah. point of integrated systems. Yeah. In That also by three orders of magnitude, not just on the internals. Okay, so picking up on feasibility, <laughs> IBM is known for pushing the cutting edge of, of technology. In quantum information science and engineering, there have been many advances over the past few years. Tell us what you think the future will look like. You know, what will we see, say, in the next five years? Where will the biggest impact be from IBM's perspective? I think the biggest impact will be in, in five years. will be in what I would call quantum systems which will do things of utility. Uh, by utility, I mean they will do things that are probably outside the economic range for classical computers. It's kind of funny to call all of today's computers classical, but I'm gonna use that word. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, gonna be outside the realm of what classical computers can do. I think we'll see that. But my viewpoint, and I'll completely acknowledge I'm probably in a bit of a minority, is that it's gonna be different than how people are predicting. I think that a lot of this will come from computers that are still error prone. And this is not from fault tolerance or constructing completely clean uh, qubits. And my intuition on this goes back to nature. So, okay, these computers are in a sense mimicking nature. That's not my phrase, I think that was Feynman's if I remember right. And so if these computers are faulty deep underneath, but nature is also faulty, every chemical reaction is not perfect. Meaning not every single pair uh, bonds, even in the presence of catalysts and other things. Which problems could be amenable to solving on a error-prone faulty computer? And then where are those thresholds? Probably 30% error is too much, but if we can get it down to 0.1% and maybe run it for a few milliseconds, which problems can be solved? And I think that this is an unknown where not that many people are working, but this is well within range of mathematicians, physicists, chemists, uh, computer scientists to sort of think about, about that. And uh, the second intuition, look, I was trained as an information theorist. Everything there lives in the world of errors. I mean, there is no such thing as uh, perfect information theory. You do a lot of work to make it uh, fault tolerant even in that world. But deep underneath, if you have errors, then how do you begin to go forward? And I think that if one can go figure that out, which problems could I still get into some reasonable bound, 
you know, like Monte Carlo simulation is not perfect, but I'll tell you, everybody here who's in the finance world, probably more than the finance world, even in the materials world, uses Monte Carlo simulation to great effect. And so which problems are going to be there? That's one. Two, I think at five years, we are still going to be discovering new things in these systems. Um, I completely agree these systems are going to be modular. I mean, a single massive system at 100,000 qubits or even 50,000 is unlikely. So how do you begin to scale it and how do you solve all the problems? You get massive connectivity locally, but then less um, at a distance. It's still gotta be sufficient, but less. How are you gonna still have these systems work in the presence of all that? And when I think of all the applications, I get super excited, whether it's in materials or in uh, risk or in financial algorithms, probably optimization. My gut tells me we need bigger machines for optimization, but I'm not 100% uh, sure. The reason I'm not 100% sure is I would never bet against the mathematicians who can decompose problems and then say, I can solve it and then put it back together. Okay. So that's a bad bet uh, to, to take. Well, thanks for that. That's a really great perspective on, uh, on, on the future. You know, I mean, IBM has showed even this summer that if you reduce just, just the right amount of noise, you can already show that quantum computers are useful versus classical computers. The goal is usefulness, not just perfection. Yeah. But so given this, what do you think some of the challenges are? Um, and are the challenges different from those that are faced in other industries, for example? I'd say that this is... Um, one of the few things that is probably harder than rocket science is probably quantum right now. Yeah. So I'd say that the problems are different as in, in many industries, problems are of scale. Is there a business model, amount of capital? Yes, those problems are here too, but I think there's more. There is fundamental problems. Um, what is a great qubit that you can design? None of us quite know. All of us are working on our own. I mean, every company you take, whether it's us or Google or Photonic or Alice and Bob or Pascal is all working in their own technology. The fact they're all completely separate and that's 1% of the issue. Next, how do you put them together? Because in order to get these systems to really work and for everyone to get access, they've got to be based on technologies which are manufacturable. And by manufacturable, it doesn't have to be an existing technique but it's got to be something which makes these systems economically feasible and viable. You then got to begin to scale them. You've then got to talk about all of the electronics to control them. I personally believe that these systems are going to be hybrids, meaning you're going to mix classical computing and quantum computing because to knit together an answer from quantum computers, it's probably way cheaper to do it on a classical computer. So why not take advantage of what's there? But that brings down how do you have these algorithms that are going to say, I can take something apart and stitch back the result? If I think back to sort of my career in uh, classical computing in the 80s, this was the boundaries of computer science. How do you take problems and decompose them? Over 20 years, that became much more natural and people began to think about it. By the way, that only solved 10% of the problem. The other 90 people just kind of put to the side and said, we'll worry about it later. Which ones can you do like that uh, is going to come down here. And then these things have to work in a way that they run 24 by 7. They don't uh, need people to come in and tune them every few hours. So I think that there is a set of problems here as, as you go through. There is something in it for people who are really doing work on the frontiers of research, to people who worry about how do you deploy these things, to what would be the business model here, and if you think about it in computing, there's lots of different business models. Software people make money by giving their software to hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of people. That's one business model. So the per unit is low, but the quantity is really, really high. You get to the hardware world, usually the quantity decreases because the number of people deploying infrastructure, especially in a modern cloud world, is more limited. But then each of them buys and consumes a whole lot. So you have different business models depending on where you are. And that part, here is a Question mark, is the business going to be in people paying for the utility of what you can do? Are they going to be paying for time on a quantum computer? Are they going to be paying for a whole quantum computer? Are you going to pay only for the software or only for the hardware? So 
I think there's a lot of challenges here, but that makes it interesting. That mm -hmm. makes it uh, exciting. Right. And there's just enough success in every front to keep propelling us forward, right? Absolutely. I see. Uh, that's why I don't go to, there isn't a, there isn't a sort of a fundamental answer here. Many, many possible answers could work. And we've got to sort of just make enough progress to, to get there. So, you know, really, so there are big, there are big challenges on, on, on many different scales. And you know, we know that we can't do this alone, not, not as, as great as IBM is, that you can't do everything by yourself. So we've you heard a lot about the quantum ecosystem this mm -hmm. morning. I'd like to talk a little bit about, hear a little bit about your IBM's philosophy on collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I fundamentally believe that these problems at this scale can only be solved with collaboration. So I'll just sort of begin there. Let me first give a lot of credit to all the places where we get students from, where people are coming with ideas, with experiments, that the work even that we do is based on what they've actually already acquired and learned. Whether it's out of schools like Waterloo, or Yale, or Chicago, or MIT, these are schools that we all are hiding from amongst, I'm sure, hundreds of others that I've forgotten to name, which is based on the work that faculty and graduate students, mostly graduate students, have been doing for decades. So, 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 so let's take that as a fundamental base. You then get to all of the people doing the mathematical work to say, which problems can you solve on a quantum computer? So just for those who don't live in the world of quantum information science, if you say classical computers are good at solving this set of problems. By the way, this is only like, I'm gonna make the mathematicians squirm and I say, that's only 10% of all the problems in the world that can ever be solved on a classical computer. There's another 10, maybe 20, we don't quite know, that could be solved on a quantum computer. There is an overlap, that overlap is small. So beginning to understand, and those folks beginning to characterize this all a lot more, is gonna come out of the, I think largely the academic ecosystem would be my guess. Then you get into, look, if I, these systems, should we work on, we're willing to invest hundreds of millions a year. Maybe let's call it a billion, but there's a limit to even what we would invest on one technology in a given year. Should we work on making the qubit or the collection of qubits? Should we work on the control electronics? Or that could be done maybe by other people? Should we work on trying to create a software ecosystem? Which part of it should we do? Which part should others do? By definition, a e software ecosystem means there should be half a million people in it. Half a million is going to be at scale. Um, as uh, David reminded me when I was with him at a, I think an Argonne lab meeting many years ago, I'm gonna say five, six years ago, I was sort of poking at the question of what are other people working on on these topics? Because I'm convinced that you need that. Um, I was with the business community in Chicago this morning and they were asking, how do we get a ecosystem going for quantum? And I said, look, Making hardware is really hard. That probably is hundreds of millions of dollars. There will be a few, but that's not going to be thousands of companies. However, all the use cases could be done with a classical startup mentality as long as they know who to leverage for hardware. I think that should be something that uh, this area can do. With the students coming out of whether it's uh, Chicago or Illinois or Northwestern or UI Chicago, you can take the whole bunch. Why not? But that means you got to train them and you got to get it going there. So I think an ecosystem has sort of multiple sides to it. There is the whole workforce development because that allows new companies to flourish. There is the pushing the research side because that history has shown, the economists may squirm at me, but history has shown that those who push the science and technology forward usually get a massive economic benefit over time. Think internet, think mobile phones, think semiconductors, there's sort of no question about it those nations and communities get a massive advantage over time. That's two sides that's pretty clear. You now begin to think about all the local companies who want to exploit it to get back a fundamental advantage. Aerospace, materials, um, financial services, all of which are big in this area. So I think you get all of these uh, systems going and I think you get a flywheel effect going because I tend to agree, if you said five years, I think five years is probably the right time frame, which is not, by the way, massive in amount of time. But if you get the flywheel going, these benefits tend to accrue for a long time, disproportionately to the area which had the first mover advantage. Yeah. Um, 
so you, you guys have invested a lot in relationships with partnerships with national labs and academia. But another thing relevant, especially to this audience, is the relationship with startups and early and mid-tier com career companies. Can you say a little bit more about how specifically IBM might interact with this? Absolutely. Look, we're very, we try to be very clear. Whenever we work with a startup, we'll be very, very clear whether it's an area that is something which overlaps with us or doesn't overlap, we, completely transparently. Anybody who's working in an application, we can look at you in the eye and say, there's no chance that we are ever going to be overlapping with you. If it looks at the actual qubit technology, most likely the role a startup could play is saying, hey, change your qubit to ours. That's feasible. I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, my team who works on it would probably look at me and be willing to uh, bend me over a chair for saying it, <laughs> but I'm not going to be hung up on it. In the end, we want to build a system as opposed to get hung up on any one piece uh, of it. So I think that there is a lot of scope to play with startups. Now, startups play two roles. Is it that people are wanting investment or is it that the startup wants a role to play in our ecosystem? And you get both kinds. So I think people who want to exploit um, a physical quantum computer, I would say all are welcome. And probably there's going to be no business uh, conflict even over time. If it's a startup that's trying to build a physical quantum computer, I would say then we should be more careful about where the opportunity is and isn't. Then people who build components around them are, I think, all are welcome. And we've been kind of very clear about it, which is a lot of the work, by the way. Like we also work internationally in Japan. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, the work is actually in building the surrounding parts, I'll call it. So they are less interested in going after the qubit and the qubit interconnections. But they want to spend a lot of uh, time and effort on the control electronics, and to give them credit, it's been an area that they have a lot of success in over decades, so why not? Yeah. You also mentioned workforce development, and IBM has been really committed, I think, to broadening access to quantum information science and engineering through Quisket, through your HBCU partnerships, for example. Can you tell us more about why is it important to develop a diverse, large workforce, and what more can be done in that area? I think that if I look I'll draw an analogy to AI today. Mm -hmm. Every company you talk to would double the number of uh, AI developers that they could. Mm -hmm. so, so many of these technologies that we think are going to fundamentally change the way work gets done, you kind of have this long period. By the way, AI is 30 years in the making. I know that everybody regards it as the one day overnight wonder, but it has been 30 years in the making uh, deep inside uh, the academic and industrial world. And so you kind of go along, you go through some ups and downs. People say, okay, it's too expensive, too hard, too arcane, not really going to scale. I need five people here, don't need many. And then suddenly you need hundreds. Mm -hmm. So how long does it take to do that? In AI, if you're going to deploy, not invent AI, I'd say in six months, maybe a year, you can take people and make them good enough at deployment. They're not going to go invent AI, but they can absolutely get good enough at deployment. I think quantum is a bit harder. I think, uh, look, if I remember my undergraduate education and I grew up as an engineer, quantum physics was the, was the class. You know, you can tell. Um, everybody comes in, people think they're really smart, people think they can all understand everything, and somewhere in your know, sophomore or junior year, you take a quantum physics class, and within the first week, <laughs> all the engineers kind of drop out. <laughs> Not all. There's a few I look at some fatigue and others are st still there. But the engineers kind of drop out completely, and the physicists and mathematicians stay. It's a different way of thinking. I call classical computers as high school algebra on steroids. You know, it's high school algebra. That's all it is. It's not any deeper than that, okay? <laughs> now it's high school algebra, and you can do it at brute force. You can do it at massive scale. You can do it at uh, massive speed. That's kind of what it is, which means most of us have some intuition for what it's doing. Except for the physicists, nobody has any intuition of how quantum computing is working. I mean, you start talking about, okay, it's a Hamiltonian, or you take the economist, okay, it's some massive utility function, and you're trying to look for a minimum energy function. I'm sorry. A few people do, but like 99% have no intuition of how that works. So now you get into... You can't take somebody and train them into using it in three months. That's not going to happen because most people don't have all that background. 
So how do you create a workforce that can deploy them, use them, think about mapping a business problem in the end onto what these machines can do is why I'm so focused on we need to create workforces in the hundreds of thousands at a global level, at least tens of thousands in a large area like this. Otherwise, I think we will not be able to use these systems, which means they won't happen. And also, once they're trained in this area, they can do many things. At least that's what physicists tell ourselves. <laughs> I think <laughs> physicists are right. Then they can do lots of things. And actually, if there is no quantum, they can do AI at that point. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> There'll always be quantum. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> So the last question before opening it up to the audience is, uh, you know, speaking of the next generation, we have in the audience here many uh, talented people or, who are current or future quantum scientists. What advice do you have for them? And particularly in sort of difficult social and economic times, which IBM has weathered over many years, what, what guidance can you give? Look, I'm not going to comment on the difficult social times. That's a <laughs> whole topic by itself. To. <laughs> um, so my first thing would be, any of you who are really being trained in the quantum information sciences or quantum computing, uh, can we raise our hand? We would love you to write to us. We'd love you to come work for us, so I'll say that. <laughs> um, look, I think that um, you go through inflection points in computing. This is a big one. And you, you should think about how do you really hone your skills, not just in school, but that the first role you take allows you to hone your skills further. I know this sounds contrary to a lot of what is given as advice, which is go for the highest paying job as opposed to the one that lets you develop your skills further. But the question is, are you getting value or are you giving value? Normally, if you're getting paid a lot, you're probably giving value and not necessarily getting value. So what's the right balance point between those? And it's okay to change your mind also to say, hey, I want to do three years of one and then three years of the other, okay? I think that that's okay. But I would strongly urge you, given the nascent nature of this field, and if you have a real interest in being in that area, let's call it for at least 10 years, go to a place where you can definitely learn a lot more while contributing a lot more to it, right, is the advice that I would give. I think there's a lot of places uh, in this uh, country where you can do that. I think there's a very strong interest, both in government and in private enterprise uh, for quantum computing. Um, but I would ask you, I would urge you all uh, to sort of balance between uh, those two aspects. Quantum is still going to be hard. Quantum is not going to be easy. So you want to go to a place which has staying power, is going to stick to it for order of a decade, not give up uh, in two or three years because it turned out to be there was some unforeseen issue which kind of got you stuck and uh, they decided to change course. And so I would urge um, it that way. By the way, those of you who are going to go to academia, because Chicago certainly produces a lot of academics, will find that there's a lot of demand for people uh, with deep skills in this area right now. Um, a lot of schools I know have at least a couple, if not more, openings in their engineering uh, schools for people with uh, the whole collection, quantum computing, quantum sensing, uh, quantum networking, the whole area of quantum is big. I know. Um, Chicago, I think you guys opened up a whole bunch of uh, faculty appointments. Mm -hmm. I know at Illinois with the uh, Quantum Institute, you guys have opened up a, a whole bunch uh, this thing. I know from talking to the deans at MIT, Yale, it's all an area where they're all opening up more and more. And these are just the schools that I interact with personally, forget the ones that um, I don't. So I think there's a lot there between the two sides. But those of you who want to come to industry, Believe me, this is an area that is fast moving. You'll have a lot of fun. Uh, you'll build great systems. You'll discover great algorithms. Uh, so I would urge you to look at that side as well. Thank you. With that, we can open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, there's one up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question for you, Arvind. Um, I want to connect it a little bit to our earlier conversations with the NIST director, uh, Lori. Um, so we're seeing NIST creating protocols for conditioning the future market uh, in the quantum economy. Can you walk me through how IBM is uh, viewing the securitization of quantum? Okay, but securitization, I assume you mean both the decryption, encryption aspects, as well as national security, right? Yes. Both, okay. So look, national security is very clear. 
this is a technology which right now is going to be export restricted. So we don't try to get cute around it. We don't play games. We don't talk about a down version or a smaller version. We stick to the places where the U.S. government is happy that uh, machines can go, which is typically a very small set of countries. It's, it's Canada for a physical machine, right? Canada, U.K., Germany, Japan, Spain. There's a few others, right? I don't know the whole list off the top of my head. But you don't play games there. The other question that here is on the decryption testing. Look, post-quantum has been understood ever since Schor's algorithm that this is going to be an issue. But the techniques to approach it, just like, by the way, even today's encryption is not mathematically proven to be hard to break on a normal computer. It's just empirically observed. I'm being a little cynical. It's more than empirical, but it's not quite a theorem proof. Uh, Ditto, there are techniques that are at least from a dozen years of deep exploration are considered to be uh, quantum safe. A lot of them, not all of them, are around the area called lattice encryption. And so how do you make these? By the for example, on the 60 odd that Laurie talked about, the vast majority got broken, not because of the underlying math. They got broken because the implementation leaves, I'll call it signals that can be used, like for example, power consumption that can be used to break them. But out of the four that are there, we have been very strong believers that that should be done. We already have three out of the four implemented on our mainframes and on our uh, cloud. We believe that actually if you worry about data getting broken five years or 10 years from now, for that collection of data, you should start using post-quantum today, not down the road. Otherwise, all the data from last year, I don't know, is it four years, five years, seven years? will get decrypted because somebody could be storing copies of your encrypted data. So those are the sort of the two sides of your question. Question here. Well, thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. So this morning, we opened the uh, conference of, of uh, discussion of the United States investing billions. I think it's maybe it's in this 50, it's more than that overall, in classical computing. And chips, and as someone who grew up punching Fortran cards, I think that's the apt description. And then we go into a discussion of a whole new generation of possible computers, and these parallel lines seem to be going. Now, you mentioned that maybe, so how do they merge? What's the merger strategy? You mentioned there may be some problems that are always more optimal for classic computers, some always for quantum, and then you sort of merge them. What's the merger strategy? Yeah. So look, I think that with the current uh, CHIPS Act, um, with due respect to the government on the CHIPS and Science Act, only the CHIPS piece got funded. The science piece has no appropriations against it. So nice in theory, but practically uh, Congress has to do its work yet. The amount was very nice, by the way. At 200 billion over 10 years, I think it would have been a nice amount to really put a dent on the federally funded R&D, but it's yet got to be funded. CHIPS is good because it provided enough of a catalyst to get things moving. But even there, I would tell you, the jury is out on how successful it would be. Because at the, what, 37, 39 billion in the manufacturing side of chips, it'll, it'll make a difference. But it's uh, really, at the end of the day, it's two plants if you were to take the full loaded cost. Quantum, we are uh, spending, what, a billion a year right now? Uh, just a little bit more than that. There is a lot of uh, effort, and I think general agreement we should spend more. I think as a nation, we are underinvested on quantum, not overinvested. Uh, just to be uh, to give you my perspective, I think we should probably, as an aggregate, uh, probably spend 10 times more for a few years just to make sure we can have a lead and maintain a lead. It's not an area we want to fall behind. Okay, now merging them. I don't think we need to merge them. I think we need to make sure that each advances at the right pace to benefit society. And in the end, I'm going to sound really weird for an engineer, to give an economic advantage to the nation. That's what it's about. Economic, by the way, includes security. So you have to give an economic advantage because otherwise you could be holden to others. You've got to maintain that in both these areas because they're both critical for the long-term success. And so we should spend the right amount on the first one to maintain, which is semiconductor, and on the other one, quantum, to make sure that we actually get the advantage and we don't let somebody else uh, get ahead of us. So that's kind of how. But the scales are different. I mean, semiconductor and classical computing, 
is a multi-trillion dollar industry already, multi-trillion. The, the, the 40 billion helps accelerate it, but doesn't really replace the fundamentals. This other one is yet to form. It's in the nascent stages. So we are unfortunately out of time, sorry. But I'd like to thank Dr. Krishna again for a really informative, illuminating discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.